and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking at the lectionary readings, the set readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's good to have you with us, especially if this is the first time you've uh, taken a look at one of these Bible studies. Before we get started, if you've not done so already, you might like to download the sheet that goes with this Bible study. It's got the text that we're going to be looking at today. It's got some space for you to record your own thoughts and it's got the questions that we'll be looking at together. You don't have to download it, but it will help you as we move through this study. So the passage for this week continues our reading through the story of Holy Week as told to us in Matthew's Gospel. It's Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 46. And it's the story both in which Jesus is asked about the greatest commandment in the law of Moses and in which Jesus finally gets to ask the question rather than being grilled by others. Um, and he does so in a way that um, finally sees off um, those who've been attempting to entrap him and, and catch him out um, in these uh, past, past few weeks worth of readings. So without further ado, let's dive in. I've already said a bit about the scene. So we're in Holy Week. Jesus is in the temple courtyard in Jerusalem teaching the uh, assembled crowds and various people have come and challenged him and asked basically by what authority is he doing this stuff. So he's been challenged by the temple establishment, the chief priests and the elders, by representatives of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were the two main schools of thought within the Judaism of the day, and by the Herodians, who were kind of lackeys of the Roman government. They were representatives of a puppet government whose strings were actually pulled by the occupying Roman forces. Jesus has just seen off the Sadducees, who brought to him what they thought was a tricky question about resurrection. And now the Pharisees, having at one point already kind of gone off with their tail between their legs, have gathered together again, they've regrouped, and they've come at Jesus with one final test. Jesus is asked by a lawyer, which in this context means an expert in the law of Moses, about which commandment he sees as the greatest. There were 613 different commandments in the law of Moses that Jesus could have chosen from. And the way the question is phrased is makes it very clear that the lawyer is asking about the written law rather than the layers of oral law, the layers of interpretation that have been piled on top of that. So in this situation, Jesus um, is apparently being tested. That's what we're told in verse 35. It doesn't come across to me as much of a test, really, because it was actually a very common question to ask rabbis to elucidate what they felt was the greatest commandment. And it kind of suggests to me that the Pharisees were running out of good questions. This was something of a last ditch attempt to catch Jesus out in some way. He takes up their challenge, though, and engages with their question. And the answer he gives is a twofold one. So the first thing that Jesus quotes from is uh, from the book of Deuteronomy, from the teaching of Moses within that. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, specifically. There it comes from Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 to 9, that little subsection. And this was part of a prayer called the Shema. It was a prayer that Jewish people would recite every day, actually twice a day. And they still do. It's still central to their identity. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your, Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now, we, to make sense of what's being said here, we need to step back a little bit and we need to realise that what was meant in that day by terms like heart and soul is not what we necessarily mean today. Um, about 2,000 years later. So we think of the heart as being all about emotions, but that wasn't actually the case in Jesus's day. When people talked about the heart, they understood it as kind of the centre of the intellect and the intentions and the will. 
The soul was seen as the centre of virtue and consciousness and vitality and the seat of emotions. So it was quite a different understanding. And the Hebrew word that's translated as strength here could easily be translated as exceedingly or greatly. So it would be quite legitimate to translate Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 as saying, Love the Lord your God with total commitment, with your whole self, and to complete excess. Love the Lord your God with total commitment, with your whole self, and with complete excess. Which I think is a really nice way of putting it. So that's the first of the commandments that Jesus picks on. And it reminds us that loving God is not about warm, fuzzy feelings. It's about a disposition. It's about a way of life. And it's something that's manifest in both our words and our actions. So it's actually a very practical expression of love. It's agape love. It's love um, as an act of will. So that's the first commandment. The second commandment that Jesus picks out is from Leviticus. It's from chapter 19, verse 18 specifically. And it's all about showing that practical action um, and establishing social justice is deeply connected to love of God. This chapter, chapter 19 of Leviticus, um, really puts forward a strong vision of social justice and practical care for one another. It covers things like behaving with honesty and integrity and not doing things that are the opposite of that. It talks about proper financial provision for the poorest and for resident aliens living inside um, Israel and various other things that really do reflect justice and care. So um, I think this verse is less about um, again, warm, fuzzy feelings towards other people, and more again about practicality, about words and actions. We can hold these two verses together, and when we do, I think what we get is a compelling vision of how love of God and love of neighbour are actually two sides of the same coin, they are intimately related. To borrow a way of putting it from the late Professor John Hull, it's as if our relationship with God is a vertical relationship. Our relationship with others form horizontal relationships, but all of them meet in the centre at the same point. So the two sides of the same coin. It's worth pausing a little bit before we move on, though, to think about um, Matthew 22, verse 39, the latter half of that. And this idea of loving our neighbour as ourself. Sometimes I've seen this um, little um, segment of Matthew's Gospel summarised by people as love God, love your neighbour and love yourself. And the implication is that self-love is, is part of this um, commandment. I don't think that quite fits with a Hebrew mindset as much as it makes sense in our more sort of individualised Western mindset. Because the Hebrew understanding of what it meant to be a human person was far more collectivist than, than we tend to be nowadays. Um, and you might sum it up with the African principle of Ubuntu, I am because we are. What I think we can say in relation to what we might understand by self-love is that we are called, I think, to recognise just how much God loves us and to ground our identities in God's love. And I personally feel, though you may um, disagree, that actually that's quite liberating in a way that talking about loving ourselves can, 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 can't always be. Um, and fundamentally, that's because God's love for us doesn't come with any strings attached and it's unconditional. And it forms an identity for us that can't be eroded by any of the stuff that, that life throws at us. It's a completely secure identity. And as someone who's sometimes struggled to believe that they are livable, I, I actually find that very helpful and liberating. As I say, you might have different points of view on that. So these two commandments, love God with all you've got, 
of your neighbour as yourself. Form Jesus' understanding of what the law and the prophets are all about. So they're kind of the foundation of these two central pillars of Judaism, the law and the prophets. And as Tom Wright puts it very helpfully in his translation of this passage, it's as if everything else is basically commentary on these two great commandments. Love God with all you've got. Love your neighbour. So Jesus has answered the question then of the Pharisees. But now, in verses 41 to 46, it's like he turns the tables on them. And for the first time, really, we see Jesus asking them a question. He asks them a question about who the son of David is. And all this business about my Lord and your Lord might come across as rather confusing. Jesus is quoting from Psalm 110, from its first verse. And this is a psalm which is believed to have been written by King David, or was certainly accepted as, as thus in Jesus' time. And it's a psalm that's about a coronation. And so when it talks about my Lord says to my Lord, it's saying my God, Yahweh, says to my Lord, the king who's about to be coronated, etc, etc, etc. The takeaway point in all of this is that, yes, Jesus is part of the line of David. He is a son of David. But this is actually an inadequate description for who Jesus is, because it doesn't then explain why David would refer to this mysterious king about to be anointed who was linked very much with the figure of Messiah as Lord. In that culture, sons would refer to their fathers as Lord, but not the other way around. So what's going down? Well, I think what this is trying to get at is that the title Son of David is inadequate to describe who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God, as well as being the Son of David. And this passage kind of invites the Pharisees one last time to grasp hold of this and accept the fullness of Jesus's identity. But they don't. We're told that they had no answer for Jesus. And it seems that that's the point in chapter 22, verse 46, at which the possibility of further dialogue is kind of closed down by the Pharisees refusing to engage any further. So this is a powerful passage of two halves. Jesus sets out his stall and then points to that deeper sense of who he is, a deeper sense that the Pharisees and indeed the Sadducees and the temple authorities and the Herodians had really failed to grasp. And that takes us to the heart of this passage and the things that we're looking at in our questions for today. Thank you.